guys for a uh, Wednesday, middle of the week, hump day. Uh, how you doing? Uh, yours truly, along with uh, John Shannon, still isolating in uh, Edmonton. Not because of COVID, uh, mind you, just because he has no friends. You, you forgot one word, Bob. Brisk. Mm. Brisk. Brisk, Edmonton? Yes. Minus 31, is that what it is this morning? Uh, it's pretty close. Oh. I, I haven't ventured outside yet, to be honest. I, I wouldn't if I were you. <laughs> Uh, not exactly tennis weather, but that is what we're here to discuss. Uh, you, um, uh, I'm sure you you know him if you if you listen to uh, the radio program for uh, years and years and years and years and years and uh, global TV before that and who the hell knows. Um, the premier tennis ink stained wretch, Tom Tebbit, uh, joins us. Brown socks, you look beautiful. How are you? I'm not too bad, actually. Can I tell uh, Shannon a little story about Alberta? Oh, I was, sure. I, as a young man, I worked uh, in the film business, and I got to work as the third assistant director on Little Big Man with Dustin Hoffman at Morley, wow. the Indian wow. Reserve near uh, near Calgary. Sure. And uh, anyway, one week uh, I think it was like plus four, it was forty degrees, and then the next week was minus forty degrees. And they actually came up in November to shoot the scene. Actually, it was a scene when Custer obliterated, I think, an Indian village. And it, it got warm and it had to go all the way back to California. It came back again in February. So I got to go two times. But Dustin Hoffman gave us all little mugs that said 40 to minus 40, because that was the difference in the temperature in a couple of trips to uh, Alberta. You still have the mug? Yeah, I do, actually. Yeah. yeah. Although Dustin Hoffman, unfortunately, has become a little bit, uh, you know, he got involved in the, in the cancellation business with uh, Me Too and everything. So it's a little unfortunate because he was a pretty charming guy at the time. Yeah. Well, let's get to tennis, and um, we want to talk about your uh, career, which isn't exactly over, but it's, um, well, we'll tell people where, where you're at. A uh, bunch of matches last night, some good news, some bad news. We'll start with the bad, because um, at the top of the list in tennis in this country is still Bianca Andreescu, although she really hadn't played for over a year. Um, struggled in her first round match, but prevailed in three sets, and then get, gets blown out 6-3, 6-2, uh, last night, uh, she said her serve was crap, and I can't argue that point. Um, but what did you see last night? Is this nothing more, Tebbit, than Bianca trying to fight off the rust? Yeah, I mean, I, I thought going to the tournament, 15 months of not playing two or three rounds max. I mean, she could easily have lost in the first round. She was in trouble three all in the third set, love 40. She could have been 4-3 down, and then would have been like maybe 6-3, and she's out. So... But basically what happened yesterday is that uh, Shea Su Wei is a really unconventional player. She's got all the junk you could imagine, and, and it's really kind of a nightmare to play. I think on another day when uh, Bianca has more matches in her, she could blow her away because you can hit through a player like that. She's number 71 in the world for a reason, not because she beats everybody. But if you get her on the right day and you're not quite right and you're impatient and you get frustrated, and then Bianca even said afterwards that she, you know, she was in the hard quarantine because somebody on her flight to Australia uh, tested positive. So she didn't get out until like, like about a week ago or something. And she said actually she wasn't used to the heat as well. So lots of little reasons, but the main thing is perfectly logical that she would lose. And actually in her first match, I, I was just kind of astounded at how well she did play. So I think it's all positive for her and you kind of ignore that result. Sue is an interesting player because she um, she's one of those rarities. She hits two-handed backhands, but also hits two-handed forehands. And the obvious suggestion is, well, you try and move her to the out, you, you know, try and hit it away from her because her reach, both on the forehand and the backhand, isn't very extensive. No, exactly. But I mean, it's, it's easier said than done. For one thing, she's hitting the ball very softly to you. And usually you're used to hitting a hard ball back. So you mm. can hit a hard ball back even harder. But she's got nothing on her ball. So you tend to start to over hit and miss. And obviously, Bianca did a lot of missing last night. Hey, Tom, how long do you think it will be before Andrescu's back to where every Canadian tennis fan thinks she should be or we expect her to be? Well, I was a little disappointed, actually. I just listened to her press conference. Nobody asked her where she's playing next, but I don't know if you know this, but there's another WTA tournament in Melbourne next week. So they're, they're trying to provide as many opportunities as possible for the players to play. So I would actually think it would be great for her to play next week, and I think she'd be playing much more freely, and I think she could do very well next week. Maybe a, a month or so, a month or two. It depends. She also said she's going to play as much as she, you know, she'd like to play a lot. 
but she's always going to be careful with all the health problems she's had. So I, it'll depend a little bit what tournaments are available to play, where she wants to travel to, quarantine rules. But I mean, I, I think maybe two or three more tournaments and uh, she should be, because she's very fit. She says she has no you know, fitness issues now. So, I mean, I think uh, certainly, you know, three or four more tournaments and I can see her being back to playing very well. Because like I said, I was so impressed with how good she looked in her first match. Uh, a little known player, um, relatively speaking, Rebecca Marino um, also lost six one seven five in the uh, second round uh, from Vancouver, I think, Tom, and hasn't played in a major championship since 2013 or just the Australian since 2013. I guess a major, I forget. I saw her two years ago. She played the qualifying actually at the Australian and uh, she lost the first round. She had a back injury or something. Really, she probably shouldn't even play her first match, but she was away for five or six years because she had a, a clinical depression problem. Uh, but she's really good now. She went back to UBC. Her actually, George Hungerford, I think you might remember him. Oh, yeah. He, he, that's her uncle. And at the, what was that, the 60 Olympics, I think maybe? And, and he, he won a gold medal in rowing. So she actually did some rowing and she was at UBC studying. And, you know, I think she's really overcome all this thing. I'm very, very sadly, a year ago, her father died, which was obviously another blow. So it's really been tough for her. But I, I was very impressed with her. She got a good draw in the first round, got an Australian wild card and beat her, but played really well. And, and, and yesterday, she lost first set 6-1. But uh, Von der Sova is a very good player, finalist at the French Open a couple of years ago. Big game. And really, in the second set, I thought Marino dominated her. And she actually had a set point to push it to three and double faulted. But uh, I mean, she really played well and very impressive. She's six feet tall, has a big serve and a big game from the back of the court. She's kind of the, play, the kind of player that most of the women are used to playing. Most of the women don't have that big a serve. Most of the women probably don't have that first strike ability. I think she plays a bit of, remember, Lindsay Davenport. Lindsay Davenport mm -hmm. couldn't move a lick, but boy, she was probably the best ball striker I've ever seen. So if you can boss the points in the back of the court and you can hold your serve, then the other players get really nervous because, ooh, I got to hold my serve. I got to hold my serve because I can't break her. So she's back, I think, about 2.30 in the world. I mean, she really hadn't played all last year. She had a plantar fasciitis issue, I think, in her foot. So this is all very promising for her to have done this well. And don't forget, she did go to uh, the Middle East to qualify. She won three matches there to even get into the Australian Open. So I think it's a very positive experience for her. How old is she? Do you know? 30. Actually, it's funny. Milos and her are about two weeks apart in December. So they both turned 30 uh, two months ago. Wasn't so long ago, 30 would have been considered like a, you'd be a dinosaur in tennis, huh? And uh, now, who knows? You know, you certainly can play well into your 30s and maybe even into your 40s. Well, for sure you can if you're if you're Federer. Um, whether she has the ability to play for another five or 10 years will remains to be seen, I guess, huh? Yeah, maybe five years. Unfortunately, saw Venus yesterday at 40 years old uh, going through all kinds of agony and stuff like that. So that's tough. But Serena's 39 and she's still going strong. So... I mean, I think I don't see uh, Rebecca playing much more than maybe four or five more years um, just because I think she'll move on to other things and it gets a bit repetitive after a while. But I certainly can see her having some good years and getting back into the top 100. She played a fabulous match when in her first career, I guess, about 2011 against Venus on the center court at Arthur Ashe Stadium, the U.S. Open. And I think it was a 7-6 uh, first set and it was very close. And Venus said afterwards it was like playing herself because... You know, Venus is six foot one, Rebecca is six foot. They both have big games. So she's had a lot of promise for a long time. And, and I could see her getting back to playing pretty good tennis again. You touched on Milos. Where's uh, where's his game right now? Uh, I, well, he was horrible in the first set yesterday. But then he drilled that crazy Frenchman, Moutet, yeah. who was a bit of a head case. But uh, no, he's playing well. He's got Fuchovic in the next round. I think in the, th in the fourth round, he can play Djokovic. So that'll obviously be the, the match of reckoning. Uh, he loses the first one in a tie break and then wins um, one four four, I think, or no one one four actually. Yeah. Now he rolled him after that first set, but the, the guy's a bit of a loose cannon. Mute, he's a bit like Shapovalov. He's a rapper and does his music thing, plays the piano. Uh, didn't help. <laughs> didn't help him in the last three sets. Hold on, loose ca oh, loose cannons and playing the piano. I'm not sure that that's. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> what's the correlation tom come on now he loves a lot of different things i said he has some distractions and and okay. not only the piano but when he's playing the, the little things to get to get into his head so <laughs> uh felix oje aliasim and uh denis shapovalov will play each other in round three which if you're a canadian tennis fan is like you throw your arms up in the air because this this has happened more than once in the past where promising Canadians have to go through each other. Uh, both of them won very easily in, in, in straight sets yesterday. 
Who was more impressive in your mind? Uh, I think Felix was. I mean, he had, he had struggled the last game of the first set that he really rolled Duckworth. But Duckworth's 105 in the world, had some injury problems himself. So, um, I, you know, I think that, that was more impressive to beat him. Because Dennis, you can't really me measure yourself against Bernard Tommy. He's, he's another uh, sort of a head case. Uh, I don't know if you saw. Anyway, I can't say. I guess I can say this on camera. He had a thing when he was quarantining before the Australian Open. Uh, he was lying in bed in the room with his girlfriend. And he was chomping on, chomping on her gluteus maximus, oh, dear. Uh, un, unclothed the gluteus maximus. So he's and he's had problems with his father. He had a dominant father. His father punched out a hitting partner. Uh, he went away from tennis for a while. He's had a couple of hip surgeries. But he's a really a genius player. I mean, he, I don't know how he got through the qualifying to get to Australia. But he's a very talented player. He's fun to watch. There's an old player called Miloslav Machir from the Slovak. Republic, who was fun to watch too. He, like he very effortless, sort of goes around the court. You don't think he's doing anything. Boom, he's playing really well. But he's 28 or 29 years old. His best days are past. I'm not quite sure. He's actually been involved. I guess I'm getting a little bit X-rated here, Bob. But he's actually been involved in some porn videos. And so, I mean, he didn't know whether he was trying or not last night, really, against Dennis part of the time, although he put up some resistance in the second set. But so you can't really measure Dennis's match. But I mean, Dennis was sensational in that first match against Sinner. So I think he's probably playing a little bit better than Felix going in. But um, it's going to be a fascinating match. I, I speculated last night, and I think I'm right because I go back a long time. But I don't think two Canadians have ever played themselves on the main stadium at a Grand Slam tournament. And uh, I think there's a fair chance. Kyrgios is playing against team on Friday, but Kyrgios likes to play in a stadium called now John Kane. Used to be a Vodafone, used to be High Sense, used to be Melbourne. It's the second stadium. It's kind of the people stadium. It's actually mm -hmm. a drum. It's a big, ugly place. But Kyrgios likes to play there because he gets all, he gets more, not the, the shishi crowd who are in Rod Labor. He gets the common folk who are in, <laughs> in High Sense and they get a little more rowdy. So he loves to play there. So I think there's a fair chance he'll, he'll definitely has to play in that stadium. If they put him there, I think Felix and Dennis has to be on Rod Laver. I don't know if it'd be a night match or afternoon, but anyway, really, it's going to be fun to see them just because uh, obviously they're both very promising players. Uh, uh, Dennis has beaten him twice at the U.S. Open. The first time uh, Felix had a heart racing problem. Yeah, <clears throat> he no. had, to, had to stop, which is very sad. And then last year, I guess uh, 2019, actually, Dennis absolutely blitzed him. And I, I, think, I think Felix just wasn't prepared somehow. Dennis just came out just like uh, a ball of fire. And Felix was like shell shocked, and he drilled him. So I, I think Felix is is born. And this time the dynamic I think is a little bit more in uh, in Dennis's favor, which might might be good for Felix because he's not the favorite. Uh, the pressure is a little bit more on Dennis, and maybe Felix can loosen up and really play a good match. And so I think it should be very competitive. Well, I watched the OJ Elias team. Um, Duckworth is the guy he played right uh, yesterday, yep. uh, last night. I was really impressed with Felix and especially his mobility. And I know that's always been there. Um, but he is, he is a much more mature, well, not surprisingly much more mature player than what we saw two years ago when he kind of first bur uh, burst on the scene. I was really impressed with the way he played. I think he's got a shot against, uh, against Dennis. Oh, no question. It's a shot. I mean, the thing about Felix, actually, I've always asked this about Felix is six foot four. And this is one thing that's happened probably, I mean, somebody said it happened, started with Murat Safin about the year 2000, but these big guys now move like little guys. Uh, yeah. Rigo, Rigo Pelka, the American guy, six foot 11, and you watch him move, it's very impressive. But I mean, I, I really think that, you know, Felix does have a shot and that the pressure is on Dennis. And, uh, and the thing I've always said about the two of them, it's sort of funny, um, <clears throat> would you rather be six foot four and a big powerful right-hander or would you rather be six foot or maybe slightly less and have be left-handed? Because left being left-handed is a big advantage in tennis. So it's sort of an interesting uh, juxtaposition. Six foot four, because you have a little more leverage, have a better angle to serve and all that stuff. Or to be left-handed, which is always tricky for anybody to play against. I mean, Federer always said, why did Nadal have to be left-handed? You know, I mean, if Nadal had been right-handed, I think Federer would have have a much, much better record against them. Well, explain that because, uh, you know, from my perspective, the reason lefties are pro are potentially problematic is because you don't see very many of them. Is it as simple as that? I think it is as simple as that. I mean, it's a bit like left-handed pitchers in baseball, but I mean, sure. you put a premium on them because you want to have them because they are different. So, but you know, the ball, no, the ball comes in at a different angle. I know I played a little bit of tennis and I haven't played many left-handers in my life, but at one point, maybe 15 years ago, I played against this left-handed guy and all of a sudden the ball's coming at you this way instead of coming at you that way. And, and you're waiting for it and it comes right in on you. 
So it's in that the pros are obviously uh, better at. I heard a good story the other day, which I, I've never heard before, but Rod Laver, well, he's a left-hander, maybe the best one ever, ever, um, along with Nadal. But uh, from about 62 to 68, he played the pro tour with Gonzalez and Rosewell and Lou Holt and all he's got. <laughs> Apparently for five years, Laver, a left-hander, never played a left-hander. Hmm. Because all the guys in the pro tour, and there are only eight or 12 of them, they were all right-handers. So it's uh, hard to believe even though they're not that many left-handers, you'd go that long a time without playing a left-hander. And for the naive, isn't it just as simple as spin, isn't it? Isn't yeah, it just spin, as simple yeah. as spin? Yeah, exactly, just as simple as spin, yeah. So uh, you, want to, you want to pick one between Elias, uh, OJ Eliasim and um, Shapovalov? Uh, logically, you have to, I think you have to go with Dennis. But, I mean, it would be fun to see Felix win just because uh, – Felix did beat him. It, it, as pros, it's two and one, the two U.S. Open wins for Shapovalov. Felix did beat him in Madrid on clay in 2019. So, he, you know, he has a, a win over him. And I think, actually, I'm not positive of this in terms of the relationship between the two. Uh, Dennis is 16 months older, and I think he's always been like a big brother. Mm -hmm. And I think Felix himself and probably his people as well, and I, I'm pretty sure I know this, they're sort of saying, like, can't be quite that friendly with Dennis anymore. You can't sort of have him be the dominant guy and so I think Felix is much more leery now, much more sort of prepared to, you know, put the friendship aside, certainly when they're out in the court and, and maybe not let Dennis be sort of the dominating guy. But in terms of game, I mean, Dennis really, there's, uh, I, so, I don't know if you guys remember a guy named Henri Lacone, a French player, another guy named Peter Corda, actually, Bob, you'd know, because he's the father of the two golfing, uh, Jessica Corda, I guess. And, mm -hmm. and Peter, Peter Corda is a left-hander, uh, a lot like Dennis. Uh, Lacone, an electrifying player, just like the ball just, pshew, booms off his racket like it's a god-given gift you can't teach anybody to play like that it's like Federer because you know you know Nadal has always said about Federer of course if I could choose how to play I'd play like Federer but he's not born to play that way so anyway uh, Dennis just has that ability to hit those shots but also he's also been a little bit shaky in some key moments and matches that's why he hasn't probably done better the last year or so although he's done quite well is the nerve seems to get to him the double faults creep, creep in double faults creep in with felix as well so we'll see maybe whoever hangs on to the nerves the best but i think obviously a slight edge to shapovalov i probably should know this but um i'm i'm really intrigued i don't know if you know uh, how the quarter girls wound up getting into golf when their father was a tennis player um and and i asked that because I was always brought up with the impression that if you're going to play golf at any kind of level, the last sport you should play as a side sport is tennis because the mechanics of the two sports do not go hand in hand. Um, do you know anything about the background of how, how the, a, a, a tennis player raises two LPGA and really good LPGA players? Well, a quick sidebar here, Sebastian Cord of the Sun is now doing extremely, extremely well in tennis. I think he won a tournament recently. He probably should be at the, at the Australian Open. He plays really well, and he's in the top 100 now, and he's a big, tall guy and very good. So he's going to be a tennis player on that side of the siblings. I don't know the story. It's funny because Yvonne Lendl has five daughters, and they all were into golf and not into tennis. So I think part of it is the, the um, child wants to go a different route, doesn't want to Maybe. be brand being, being the same thing. Actually, the interesting thing with the court is, is uh, uh, Peter's wife and, and Sebastian and Jessica's mother is a former Czech tennis player. She was very good, uh, Regina Bachikova, and she got to be like number 30, 35 in the world. So there's an even stronger tennis background because of both parents being tennis players, but the, the two daughters obviously uh, become great golfers. I and actually, I guess you, you've seen. You, you mentioned Lendl. Uh, I think Lendl likes to play golf himself now more than he likes to play tennis. Oh, yeah, yeah, no, he loves to play golf. Uh, the, <laughs> I guess the funny thing about the court is actually, I don't know if you've seen this, but Peter won the Australian Open, I think it was 1998. Got a bit lucky. I think he beat Marcelo Rios in the final. It wasn't the strongest final, but he was a very talented guy. But he used to do this, like, scissor kick when he was on the court. And when Jessica won the Australian Open in the, in the women's golf, they got pictures of her doing, like, the scissor oh, wow. kick. And I think she's done it at other tournaments ever since, sort of uh, duplicating her father, which is it's kind of a fun story. All right, let's uh, focus a little bit, uh, or we want to focus a little bit on uh, on Tom, who um, sort of announced his retirement, but I'm not 100% sure that that's an, an, a, a completely accurate assessment. We're going to take a break, come back right uh, just a minute or so from now. Uh, Tom Tebbett is with us today on the podcast. With Tom Tebbett. So, are you retired? Are you partly retired? Have you just stepped away from Tennis Canada for a little while? 
What the hell are you doing? Who knows, Bob? Uh, no, I think a, a couple of funny things. Uh, I actually reached my 100th Grand Slam tournament in a row. I think it's 140 overall, but 100 in a row at the Australian Open last year. And who would have thought a pandemic was coming right after that? So I've been thinking about doing it. Um, and, and it sort of seemed like a good time. But, you know, I had 20 years at the Global Mail, 10 years with Tennis Canada. Um, I just sort of thought it was a, a good time. They actually talked to me in December about coming back for 2021. And that forced me to make the decision because I'd always told them I'd give them fair warning. So uh, I mean, one, I told some people the other day, I don't know if you remember Monday night, but Rebecca Marino played the first match at 11 o'clock in the morning. Uh, Dennis played till one o'clock in the morning the next day. So I was thinking if I was there, plus you had three other people playing that, Canadians playing that day. And I'm a freelancer. Uh, I handle most of my, or all my expenses, stay with friends in Australia. So I would have been going home if the trams are still running, which they weren't at one o'clock in the morning to write till four or five in the morning. Mm -hmm. uh, and then to send my thing back, because I took pictures too at the Australian. Once I became a blogger, I started being a photographer too. So it was a lot of work. And so I can work till four or five in the morning, you know, a day or two in a row. But if you start doing that five and six days, uh, <laughs> where's your yeah. I'm into my 70s. I, I think I'm in still pretty good shape, but it's just a lot of things like that you sort of think. But plus, uh, I just thought like to leave on my own terms, and uh, I, mm -hmm. I think it's the right decision. But I want to stay involved. I'd like to still go to some tournaments and uh, do some work for some people. So we'll just see how that plays out. But Tom, the, you you talked about all the Grand Slams. Uh, when the Australian Open started, you had to have some angst. There had to be something in your gut, something that said. Why aren't I there? Yeah, I mean, I actually, at one point this fall, I thought about going because uh, at one point there were people going to leave in mid-December to get there and it was going to be held starting in, in like the 18th of January, but now it's started the 8th of February. And I thought, heck, you know, I think I might go because you know, I live by myself. I could quarantine for two weeks. If, if people are leaving on the 15th of December, no, no, no good to the family. And a lot of, you know, companies are not going to pay for two weeks in isolation when you get there. And I thought, well, maybe I'll fork out and then I can would stay with friends and all that stuff. And it'd be great to be there because there'd be no journalists there from I mean, foreign journalists, obviously, mm -hmm. from New Zealand and Australia. So I thought about going. No, obviously, I missed it. The nice thing that we forget here, and it's been like 25 years in a row of going, is you. it's like landing in the middle of July in Canada. Right. You know, you're right in December, which yeah. I think January, the worst month here, really, because now things are starting to look better. The sun's stronger. It's good. But I mean, in January, to be in, in Australia walking around in shorts and a t-shirt. And the other thing is everybody there, of course, in a fantastic mood because the kids are out of school, people are on vacation, the Australian Open's there, Aussie rules football hasn't started, so there's no competition for the tennis. The whole country's nuts about tennis. And you just wander around and you think, my goodness, what am I doing here in January? So I've, I've been lucky I had like 24 Januaries like that. And I miss that, obviously I miss the tennis. And there's something uh, I've always said is Rod Laver Arena, you're sitting there uh, in the Antipodes, in January and a night match and the crowd's there and you look up the birds are chirping and you're watching the tennis, you're thinking, well, this is heaven. I mean, Wimbledon Center Court is classic and all that, but sitting in Rod Laver Arena in a, in a night in January, uh, you know, with the birds and, and the stars in the sky. And it, it's never really hot at night there. It can get extremely hot sometimes during the day, but at night it's always very pleasant. And, you know, people are going out for a drink and watching the matches. And it's, it's there's really nothing better than that in terms of like almost a physical experience. Well, I, I, well, I'm going to ask you what your favorite place is. Um, did you go to Rome often? Did you do I went, Rome? I went there once because I always want to see the Italian Open. I'll never forget. Actually, I think I was watching about Rink and Federer play Nadal and Moy in a doubles match. I'm sitting in the crowd. This is typical Rome. And there's like a 16, 16 17 year old boy and girl. And they were watching like they, they kissed a little bit and then just start watching the tennis, then they start kissing a little bit and watch the tennis. And it was perfect Italy, you know, perfect Italy just to be in Rome. But no, it was great to see that time. I, went, I had to see that. So I went there once. And actually, because I had a friend who was, uh, I don't know, I know nothing about sailing, but I got to go to uh, Valencia. A friend of mine was covering the America's Cup sailing. And I got to go there because he had an apartment. I was able to stay there. So I combined that same trip in 2007. But in terms of, you know, the Grand Slams, it's really hard to, to pick. Uh, it used to be the French for me because I speak French. I'm from Quebec. Uh, I love going there. Obviously, France, the food, the, the, the style, the, the beautiful red clay courts. But it's gotten a little crowded there. So then I started liking Wimbledon maybe a little more because uh, they've done a better job maybe expanding the site. And it's Wimbledon, it's the grass. And you walk around on the days when there's nobody there, you can actually smell the grass. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, it's not mm -hmm. too many. You no know, other tennis events where you can smell the playing surface. So it's great, but then I just told you about Australia. Well, U.S. Open is great, but it's, it's just too much like home. You know, you don't have to change your 
your adapters for the power for your electricity and all that sort of stuff is just too familiar. So it's a great term. But the other three, obviously, each of them has their own traction. I have a bias. I, I anything that happens in London, I would go for twelve hours. I would just go. I mean, London to me is just such a magical city, and so many things happening all the time. And to take being able to take the subway, taking the tube to Wimbledon. I mean, there it, it's they make it easy. They make it easy. Yeah, they make well. No, there's no question. I think if you have to pick one, you think where should you go? You got. I mean, Wimbledon's a cathedral. I mean, it's the beginning of tennis is there. Uh, Arthur Ashe once said, the uh, first year I went there was 75, and he once said, uh, Wimbledon is one of the events of the world that you're not disappointed by when you get there. You know, it lives up to your expectations, and I think that sums it up pretty well. <laughs> didn't Arsh, didn't, didn't Ashe win Wimbledon in 75? That was the year I was there, first year I went there. He won and he beat Connors in the final. Connors probably yeah. wasn't. And, I don't know why that sticks in my head, but, it, but as soon as you mentioned 75, well, Ashe Wimbledon, I went, I think he won that. Yeah, one of the well, the only one, the only woman that he won, and then yeah. he uh, he uh, had a heart attack a couple of years later, right? And then he got blood transfusion, he got AIDS and stuff like that. Also, '75 was the last year Billie Jean King won, and you know she's an old geezer like I am now, but you wouldn't believe how much fun Billie Jean King was in those days. She had frizzy hair. She was talked about in February. She's like, oh, I'm riding on the train, so I don't know West Virginia or Pennsylvania or something. Oh, I might try Wimbledon this year. And, and she was just a real charmer. She was lots of fun. And she was a hell of a player, too. She was really fun to watch because she had a lot of variety and, and a lot of spunk and obviously a very smart woman. Well, who are some of the other of your favorite players that you've seen over the years? Because it's a long career, pal. Uh, well, Federer, obviously, I think probably the top of the list. Um, you know, I mean, actually, uh, McEnroe probably the, the – most fun player to watch, most uh, aesthetically and uh, uh, stylistically talented player I've ever seen. I mean, he was a magician, but he was also a, pardon my Francais, a bit of an a-hole or more than an a-hole on court, which drove mm -hmm. me nuts sometimes. But he things he could do with the ball was just fantastic. Uh, in terms of personalities, uh, Mats Vilander is just a great guy. I mean, Mats is now sort of on the broadcasting side and he's not afraid to give his opinion and say things. Mm -hmm. Uh, which you sort of admire because, you know, a lot of you guys know this, a lot of ex-athletes are a bit hesitant, but Matt tells it like it is. And, you know, he's always friendly to just a Joe Bull like me and stuff. So I've always liked him a lot. Um, uh, Martina and Chris Ever have been great. Martina really is a very impressive woman. I mean, I, I remember like she had, she's always had a tremendous curiosity about the English language and stuff. I remember when she first started six of one, half a dozen of the other. I mean, for somebody from the Czech Republic to pick up on all the phrases and stuff. So I've always had a, a great admiration for her. She's terrific. And, you know, been lots of other, uh, you know, very interesting women players over the years. Stylistically, there's a player named Hanna Malikova. I always like to pronounce it the right way from the Czech Republic, who was a beautiful player. And obviously, uh, I mean, Serena is just the best player I've ever seen. Um, she's terrific. And obviously lots of the uh, sympathy for Monica Seles for what happened to her, because I always think, she would definitely have had as many grand slams as Steffi Graf if she hadn't been stabbed in a horrible thing in, uh, yeah. I guess, 1993. I, you know, the one name you you did, you you omitted there, and I don't know whether it was accidentally or, I mean, I don't think he was before your time, was Bjorn Borg, who in, in a period of time, I thought, was as good a player as I've ever seen. Unfortunately, his career, by his own choice, he I think he was, what, 26 or 27 when he quit? Yeah, 25, 26, no, very young. No, no, Bjorn, actually, I got to know Bjorn a little bit. Took, took him to a hockey game, actually, in Montreal once. Oh, did he? Working in a tournament at 79, and uh, actually, he finished a match. It was a Friday night game for some reason, and you know, John, there are not many Friday night games in Montreal. No. And so he finished his match early, uh, I guess started at 6, finished like 7 or something. So we actually rode the Metro. It was from um, Morris Richard Arena in uh, in the east part of Montreal. So we actually rode the Metro to, <laughs> to uh, the Forum. We got off. And we, we got off and I took him in because that was the quickest way to get there. We took him in the stadium and coming in the entrance, Roger Doucette was there, the guy who used to sing the National Anthem in Montreal. Mm -hmm. he, he just sung it at the tennis of Morris Richard. So he says hello to Roger. And then we're walking around behind the, uh, the, 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 the rink, at the end of the rink, behind the net. And somebody in the crowd, he yells out, tennis. I'll never forget, they didn't say board. They, Tennis. And so Bjorn and I sat right near about two rows off the court, right at center ice for the first period. The end of the first period, he got mobbed. You know, I well, I was going to say, I mean, there was there was probably no more instantly recognizable <laughs> figure in the game physically than Bjorn Borg. He had, you know, he had the uh, the mullet, the long hair. Um, they used to say he had 4% body fat or 2% body fat or something. 
that he was one of the best conditioned athletes anywhere in the world. Yeah, for sure. I mean, he uh, he was probably the second most famous athlete in the world at that point behind Muhammad Ali. Anyway, long story short, so after the sec second intermission, they invited us into some private lounge, and I actually saw a guy I knew there. He started telling Bjorn about my tennis game, which was kind of crazy. But And after the game, we went into the locker room, and every single one of the Canadians came up to him and got oh, their sure. picture with him. Oh, and I'll, then, I'll never forget Larry Robinson gave him his hockey stick. <laughs> so Bjorn and I are in the cab going back to the hotel afterwards. <laughs> Bjorn says to me, every kid in Sweden would like to have Larry Robinson's hockey stick. <laughs> I don't think he took it on the plane home, who knows? But anyway, it just showed you the, the but Bjorn was not aesthetically a, at all like McEnroe. I mean, he's the best athlete I've ever seen until Nadal. And the other person I didn't mention this is Nadal. And I knew him just a little bit, and he's a prince of a guy. I mean, Roger's a prince of a guy. They're all, compared to, you know, McEnroe, Connors, and Nastasi back in the day, I used to think, what's it gonna be like in 40 mm -hmm. years? Come on. And then you got guys that are all great guys now. But I you mean, know, it, some the, 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 for some reason, because uh, I grew up uh, at a time when Borg was the man, he was the guy. Uh, and every time I see Federer, uh, not, and I, I, I can't analyze their tennis style, but any any time I see them, it's it's that quiet demeanor uh, between the two that I always, to me, there's a comparison. I, I, when I see Federer, I think of Borg a lot. Well, the common thing there is they were both bad actors, you know, uh, temperamental guys when they were young. And Bjorn got his racket taken away from him for about three or six months or something. And thereafter, Mr. Cool didn't show his emotions. And Roger was a very temperamental too early on in his career. And then he finally figured it out. So it really worked out well for them, obviously. Uh, but Bjorn, Bjorn, just fantastic athlete, but like not, not a tennis player. Like McEnroe was just a genius. I mean, you, you just sit there and watch me. Like, how can you do that? I mean, you know, I guess it's like Big David. So it's, it's that kind of talent. Gretzky kind of stuff. McEnroe was like that. Federer's like that. You know, been a few guys like that. It's just a natural gift. And thank goodness they, they keep coming along. Dennis is like that. It's, you know, I always wonder, because I remember when before Federer came along, there was like Safin and Hewitt, Brodick were kind of mechanical guys. And you think, is there ever going to be another? Well, San Francisco is a very nice player too. Are you ever going to get another one of those players? And then boom. Federer falls from the sky right when you need it the most. And, you know, Dennis come along now. And, and lots of guys have nice games, but some guys just have that gift that makes them extra special to watch. I, I'm, I'm probably wrong on this, but um, to the best of your knowledge, was Borg the first to use the two-hand backhand? Uh, no. I think, I, I, think, I think there was a guy named John Bromish in Australia way back when. And actually, one interesting story. But there weren't many. Talk. No, there weren't many, but, but Lauren Maine, the Canadian, Lauren Maine won Monte Carlo, I think, in 1954. That wasn't the best field, but that was, Monte Carlo was a big tournament. And Lauren, I think, was the first guy to, to like Monte Caselish, et cetera, and like, obviously, Shea Su Wei, to use two hands on the racket on both sides. So Lauren Maine was an innovator in terms of, of that. And the funny thing about Lauren is, my unfortunately died within the last year, but Lauren, um, after he played, actually was a, a pretty severe alcoholic for a while, and about 45, boom. He cut it all out and he came back and he played senior tennis and he won virtually everything 50 and over 60 and over 80 and over i mean he was unbelievable and when he came back he played with a one-handed backhand he wouldn't play with the two hands anymore it was really strange so you're a, i mean you've been a tennis guy all your life um, um and you've become well known for it and that's how i know you is there another sport that's um a favorite or maybe the favorite oh well tennis is the favorite um <clears throat> i wasn't going to tell you the story i was a basketball player believe it or not at this fantastic basketball school three rivers high school in quebec Ooh, <laughs> baby but that a tough school <laughs> anyway no, I, won, I once scored i once scored 42 points in a 32 minute game against quebec wow. high school. 19 for 25 and four for four at the line and I also actually made the Carlton University basketball team when I went there. Um, I always say in 1965, I don't know who Tom Gorman is, but he was one of our good players. His family owned the racetrack in Ottawa. His grandfather was Tom Gorman. Uh, sure, general, sure. I think you know this. He was the general manager of the Canadians, I think. Sure he was. Yeah, and Gorman's actually, a famous hockey name. Yeah, and Tom Tom is now married, I believe, to Peter Vansbridge, his sister. Anyway, that's a lot of gossip. But Tom Gorman was on that team. So we went to the national championships. We lost to Acadia. I was the worst guy in the team. I'm not being modest. I was the worst guy in the team. It was a very good team. And we lost to Acadia. And it was Brian Heaney and Steve Konchowski. Uh, and I think pretty good players. Good. Yeah, they're very good players. So so I played at Carlton. And one last thing, which is sort of stupid to tell you about, but I 
try to hold myself here. I once made 59 shots in a row in uh, the gym at McGill when I was just after. So I, could, I could, couldn't jump, I couldn't play defense, I couldn't do anything, but I could shoot. And I'll never forget, Mary, uh, Maria Shokova was going out with Sacha Vujicic of the Lakers about uh, five years ago. And he was at the French Open. So he's sitting there by himself at one point in the players area and I was able to get in there. I saw him, so I went and sat down and I said, uh, I don't know, I shouldn't say this, I'm embarrassed, but you know, I said I'd made 59 foul shots in a row once in the gym. And I asked him how many he'd made. And he said, well, I think it was 180 or something. But he said, he said to me, some, some NBA players couldn't make 59 in a row. And we know who's at the top of that list. Well, Shaq. Shaquille O'Neal. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, yeah. I could shoot foul shots better than Shaquille O'Neal. Yeah. Hey, you know, we, we were touching briefly on golf and we, everybody talks about how golf has changed, not because of the golfers, but because of the technology. Is tennis the same way or is tennis the reverse? Because it, it appears to me that athletes in tennis are better, but how much, you know, and you can talk about rackets changing a bit, but have rackets changed that much? I think they have changed a lot. Yeah, actually, one thing has changed a lot in the last few years has been the strings because uh, I'm not a, I'm just a hack player and I'll play a very good level, but the, the new strings, the Luxalon strings, they call them, you can hit the hell out of the ball, at, but it won't go out. It, you can put the, more spin on the ball, so it goes over then, and then it just dives. So it's very hard to handle. So that's one reason a lot of guys don't go to the net anymore because they, they can hit the ball so hard when you're at the net and trying to pass you. That you can't control the volleys, but there's still lots of, you know, Dennis is a good volleyer. Uh, there's a lot of good volleyers still in the game. So you see some net play, but you don't see as much. And that's one of the reasons uh, why the players are staying at the back of the court so much. And you have well, you know, you know, one of the things that um, I, I've noticed, and I can't recall why particularly, but um, those of us who have watched tennis for a number of years, we got accustomed to seeing players almost between every point adjust the strings when back in the gut days right yeah as the strings would 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 go out of shape yeah and you know, two strings would be really close together so the, the guys would you know and they there were guys that would do that between every shot and then exchange change rackets all the time because strings would break strings don't break anymore you rarely see that and they never go out of shape no, they're ready to go to shape. And, and one reason they don't break anymore is the players uh, at the ball changes. The ball changes there after seven games in the first set because you have to allow two games for the uh, warm up. So, seven games and nine games after that, there's a Lendl started that. They change rackets every nine games. Mm. So, they don't get a chance. In the old days, uh, you know, sometimes you read stories about guys ran out of rackets and had to borrow a racket from another guy. And, and, and with the gut strings, obviously, they broke a lot, a lot more. So, they kind of preclude the fact that you're going to break a string nowadays just by changing the, you know, the rackets at the end of uh, whenever the ball changes happen. I think Federer does it before or after the ball change because whatever, just he doesn't want to play, he doesn't want to serve maybe with the, uh, you know, with the new racket and wants to play one game. Of the, return yeah, the other thing too is, is the size of the racket. And that's what most people talk about. And of course, when we first started to play, you know, the ra well, we thought it was a normal size racket, but much smaller. And then do you remember who the first guy was? to use the big racket? Well, the first guy was a woman, I think it might have been Pam Shriver. She got to the final of the US was Open it? as a 17 year old. And then a lot of players obviously started yeah, using Yeah, they went to it. He was the first one I remember actually. Yeah, and the, and the theory of course, you know, for amateur players, recreational players, the bigger the space you have to hit it, the less likely you're gonna knock it off the frame, right? Well, that's the same in golf too. Sure, well, it's the exact same well, principle. Yeah, it's a sweet spot. The sweet spot's bigger, just like with the big birth or whatever it is in golf. Yeah. yeah, I guess that's true. I mean, but I always thought it was it was interesting that the best players in the world ultimately went to that because I thought, well, yeah, I can hit it all over the racket, and sometimes I don't even get it on the racket. And but but they're probably dealing with a, you know, a small area of of. I can just perfection. imagine you. I could imagine you running around the court trying to hit with the big racket. I could just imagine that. Well, I I was a I was I was a late bloomer, I think. I think because I didn't play tennis all that often, I stuck to the small racket for a number of years before I finally converted. Yeah, you're still hitting persimmon too, I know. So what's wrong with persimmon? There's nothing yeah, wrong nothing, with nothing, nothing wrong Perfectly with Perfectly good. Yes, it's I do. beautiful. <laughs> and it's actually a wood, it's not a metal. <laughs> So when I hit a wood, oh, it's wood. You two guys, unbelievable. Both oh, of you. Said that. Here, Tennis oh. rackets used to be wood, right, oh, Kevin? Man. 
They're not wooden. Of course, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I all my first rackets are wooden. The, the <laughs> thing about this thing too is about the size of the racket. Is Federer actually that's maybe what extended his career. I think I, he went to 97 or 98 square inches on his racket. I think it was maybe from 90 because he had the same racket as Pete Sampras. And I think he was his hero, so he stayed with him. But then later in his career, and before he won his last three Grand Slams, for sure, he went from like 90 to 97, 98 square inches. And I think maybe he needed to get a little more pop on his shots. Well, um, I think we're going to hear more from Tom Tebbett. I don't think it's uh, it's uh, finito la musica. Um, by your own acknowledgement, you're really not sure how much you're going to do, but you love this game, and there's absolutely no reason why, other than the travel is a hassle, and we're in the middle of COVID, you can't do anything anyway. Uh, I think we're going to hear more from you. I hope we do. Um, you and I have hey, done stuff hey, Tom? together for what? No, Sorry. I, I want to. I got a question for Tom. I got a question for Tom. Is this yeah. the golden era of Canadian men's tennis? Right now, give me a break. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I mean, it's My nothing, miles. nothing close. And you had women too. You had Bouchard, who did really well, obviously, we won the final. And now you got Bianca, and then Milos has made a breakthrough, and Dennis and Felix now. I mean, it's it's incredible. I mean, it's really hey, I've got a little more time, McCowan. I want to ask you four questions real quick, okay? Or, yeah, yeah, real quick. Who's the worst? What's, the, what's, your, what's your worst interview experience? A guy who wouldn't talk or was drunk or something like that? Oh, uh, I can answer that right away. Um, but it was a put on. It was Bob Baylor. Oh yeah, baseball player, uh, Blue Jay, who I I knew very well back in those days. I used to go to spring training for seven weeks, and and so I really got to know these guys pretty well. And he came on one night, and he was on. Um, he was in the dugout, or in the clubhouse, when he came on. It was a post game talk thing, and all the guys were standing around him, and they they decided they decided or. Baylor decided all his answers were going to be one word. <laughs> well, as somebody who does interviews, I mean, it's, it's your worst nightmare. Right. So every question I asked him, yes, no, maybe. <laughs> I don't know. Number two, Tom? Uh, What's number, number two? two? Uh, the interview you're most proud of. Well, this was pretty good. Um, oh. One of the interviews with Muhammad Ali, though I couldn't pick one, maybe uh, Bear Bryant. Um, Jim Brown, those would be three. All right. I, I remember Shaky and the Pat Myerson, and we'll, we'll leave Shannon out of this. Who's been your best partner over the years? Oh, that's impossible. I mean, they were all, they've all, they've all been good or bad or unique or fun or miserable, um, depending on the day, like anybody is. You and Shaky had great chemistry, Bob. You, you and Jim Hunt had unbel on the air had well, that's great very kind. chemistry. Yeah. No, I, no, I'm not. That's I'm not being I, complimentary. I'm telling you the truth. I would say this: there was there has been no co-host that I got along worse with. Than Jim. <laughs> but, yeah, but that doesn't matter. Jim was angry at me every freaking day. Sure. Every freaking day, and I just got so frustrated with him. Um, we rarely spoke a word outside of the uh, of the studio. Seven o'clock came or whenever the show ended, and. That was it. I used to love when he walked in the door and he'd say, hello, Robert. And then the show would start. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, right. that was pretty much Here's it. the last one. And this is a trick question. It's a total setup for you, McCowan. All right. What's been your best scoop in tennis? Oh, I haven't really had one. No, you've had, you had one in 1999. Whoa. Really? I didn't have it. You had it, baby. I have no recollection, Tebbit. It has to do with Las Vegas. Maybe this helps you a little bit. You knew before many people that oh. Andre Agassi and Steffi Graf were an item. How did you get that story? Agassi, Agassi and Graf, yeah. But that, that was when they, uh, they first started. Well, Pete. so I'll tell you a background behind that a little bit. Um, when I lived in Vegas, Andre Agassi was a kid. And his coach was Pancho Gonzalez, who was... I believe at that time, the tennis pro at Caesars Palace. These are in the days when Caesars had tennis courts in behind the hotel and they would, um, they would actually do the fights. If you remember all the sure. big fights were at Caesars and they were on, on the tennis temporary stand on temp. They built temporary stands on the tennis courts. They played in an outdoor hockey game there once too, Bob. Yeah, they did. They built, and I was at a few of the fights. 
on that uh, on that tennis court. Anyways, 20,000 20, temporary seats. So I go over to Caesars one day, and I I don't know why I went in the back. It was it was you had to go right to the back of the property, and I went to the tennis courts, and I'm just standing there, and there are, there weren't a lot of people there, or a few people, but I saw Poncho was there, and I mean I recognized him, I didn't know him, and he's hitting with this kid. And I'm going to guess that he was maybe 14, 13, somewhere around there. And the kid was just like, everything was pure. I, I don't, I don't want to say he hit it all that hard, um, but everything was just pure. And I'm going to guess Poncho was in his fifties, late fifties at the time. Maybe you'd know better than I would Tebbit. And um, so I didn't make that much of it, but I, I thought, wow, this kid can play. So as it happened, I go back inside the casino and I don't know what I was doing, having lunch or something. And I'm walking down this hallway and who's coming towards me the other direction is Poncho. And I thought, what the hell? And so I stopped him and I introduced myself and I said, I was just watching you hit balls with some young guy back there. I, I said, who's that? He said, oh, he's going to be the next great player. I said, what's his name? And he said, Andre Agassi. And I don't know why that stuck in my head, but it, I, I remembered it. I remembered that name. And all of a sudden, Agassi appears on the, on the circuit. And I go, oh, that's the kid I saw. And one thing leads to another, and he eventually becomes the number one player in the world and all the other stuff that we all know happened about Agassi. So does that answer your question? Tom? No. And then no, how did you, where did you see, where did you see Steffi Graf? Graf? Yeah, come on, Bob. Well, no, but I got to know Agassi oh. is what happened. And see, Tom, he just took us to Montreal via Ottawa. It's unbelievable. Well, I know, you know? that's where I was headed. And then I forgot where I was going, <laughs> which no, happens but he, all the time. But he, here's the story. That would have been about mid-August or something. And the people didn't know till she showed up and watched Agassi from the stands at the U.S. Open in September. I think it was the year he won. Yeah, 1990. Mm -hmm. So that sometime in August or late August before the U.S. Open, you on your show, I'm listening, and you say, hmm. Uh, Steffi Graf and Andre Agassi. Wow. I honestly don't remember the specifics of it, but obviously somebody I was talking to, because mm -hmm. I, you know, I wound up having many friends in Vegas. I don't think it was Andre himself. Um, I interviewed him on several occasions. I remember the last time I interviewed him was when his book came out. Right. One of the best tennis books I've ever read, by the way. Well, he had a fantastic co-writer. Fantastic co-writer. And that was? Oh, I forget the name, but I mean, the guy was a brilliant writer. I think he's a Pulitzer Prize winner, actually, or something. Oh, okay. So, so I mean, Andre, Andre, and Andre is a very bright guy and had lots of stories to tell, but that, you know, oh, Pete yeah. Sampras had the same writer. Probably Pete Sampras' book would have been, you know, uh, as good see, quality. See, that, uh, what you guys were talking about, when you mentioned Agassi and Graf, to me, uh, Tom, that that's the magic of tennis and tennis gossip, because you don't, <laughs> you, you know, you, in, in the world of professional sports, you don't really for a longest time you don't say well he's he's going to be dating somebody else who's playing the sport when they're traveling <laughs> <laughs> and and when when you have the men's tour and the women's tour you know that uh, at the same place then you have that opportunity that's kind of cool yeah uh, Mo moringer was the name of the guy who wrote the book uh, right uh anyway no so that i mean that was uh, amazing that that, that happened that you got that scoop and i wish i could tell you more i don't really remember wow. the specifics of it yeah, no, um, well, that was, I mean, I, actually, I'll give you one quick last story. On their child, I uh, should know his name now, it's a bit of a funny name, but their child uh, is a baseball player. Uh, and he uh, assigned with uh, one of the colleges, maybe USC, and he's still like maybe 18 years old now. Wow. And so hopefully he's going to be a very good pitcher because he's a pitcher, but guess what? He's already had Tommy John surgery. Oh, oh every pitcher has by 18, I think. Really? Oh, <laughs> It's the new thing, Tom. We actually talked about it last mm -hmm. week on the show. Is that uh, that the, they're they're saying to kids, you might it might be better for you to have Tommy John surgery to extend your career. Wow. Well, we actually did a documentary on uh, Fadu Productions did a documentary on um, on this on the phenomenon several years ago, of all these fourteen and fifteen year old high school kids going to have Tommy John surgery yeah. deliberately, not because they were injured but deliberately because the perception at that time was that 
it, it improved your arm strength. Mm -hmm. And wow. you know, in this day and age, it is really nothing to do about how well you pitch. It's how hard you throw. And if you, if you can't throw at 95, you're probably not going to get a look. So if you're a young pitcher and you couldn't throw at 95, there was this theory out there, you go get Tommy John surgery. And then when you come back, you can throw 95 and there's some truth to it, unfortunately. So. Yeah, his, his, yeah, name is, his name is Jaden, and I think he's six foot three. And Andre's definitely a little bit under six foot, and Steffi's five nine or something. So amazing that Jaden would turn out to be that tall. Uh, Tebbit, we love you. And um, it's been a while since we've had a chance to chat. Uh, it is just great to catch up. Um, don't retire because what we're going to do is we're going to bug you periodically over the course of the year, like especially when something big happens or when there's a major championship or whatever. And uh, hopefully you'll have a few minutes to chat with us again. We, uh, I enjoyed it very much. Thanks, pal. No problem. Tom Tabbitt. Uh, for John Shannon, Bob McCown, we'll see you next time on the podcast. Friday, John? Friday with Doug Armstrong. Friday. Oh, yes, Doug Armstrong, the new general manager of uh, Team Canada, correct? Yes, sir. You're gonna, we're going to get you picked on the team, Bob. Oh, you can't yeah. play. You're American. <laughs> Well, I could play. I just can't play for that Canada. team. Well, you no, you can't play. <laughs> yeah, you're right about that too. I know. But I'm a target. I don't have to do anything. Can you still play? Can't your, play. Can still you play can't play. Boots? Do you have to have skates on if you're? No, if you're you, a target? you can use uh, you can use uh, rubber boots. Uh, we'll see you on Friday. Goodbye, don't forget everybody. to subscribe. Don't yes, forget to please. subscribe. See ya.